Welcome to Cinematic Excrement, shaken, not stirred. And it's time once again to tackle the wonderful world of Bond. James Bond. The British super spy, based on the literary character created by Ian Fleming, has dazzled moviegoers since his big screen debut in 1962 with Dr. No. And here we are over 50 years later and the world is still talking about Bond with the recent release of Spectre. And since we're once again in the midst of Bond fever, I thought now was as good a time as any to take a look at one of the franchise's weaker installments, 2002's Die Another Day. This was the fourth and final movie in the series to feature Pierce Brosnan in the role of James Bond. Brosnan's time as Bond is not typically remembered with fondness by the fans, which is really too bad. I for one thought Brosnan made a great Bond. Unfortunately for him, he got stuck with several bad Bond movies. Sure, he started out strong with Goldeneye, but they got progressively worse. And today, we're not only looking at Brosnan's worst Bond film, but in my opinion, one of the worst Bond films of all time. So let's get to it, shall we? Die Another Day starts off on shaky ground before we even get to the story, as they decided to add a little something to the famous gun barrel sequence. They added a CGI bullet to the shot. A thing that is totally necessary and does not at all make it look like the filmmakers are trying too hard to look cool. I am all for trying to put a new spin on an old thing, but there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. The right way would be what they did in Casino Royale. That actually looked pretty cool. This just looks silly. And unfortunately, it's not the only example of crappy CGI in this movie. Nor is it the only time the movie tries too hard to be cool. Hell, they keep that up with the very first scene of the film, which sees Bond and two other agents infiltrating North Korea by surfing. Fucking surfing. Somehow, I don't think that's the most covert way to enter hostile territory. Was there something inherently wrong with, you know, scuba diving? Somehow, the guards patrolling the beach don't notice them. I know it's dark out, but come on. And Bond poses as someone looking to trade diamonds for weapons. They fly off to meet Colonel Moon, played by Will Yun Lee, and his second-in-command, Zhao, played by Rick Yoon. Uh, remember the days when you could have a North Korean villain in a movie without everyone completely losing their damn minds? My, how times have changed. Yeah, I'm still a little pissed about what happened with the interview. And I didn't even like the interview that much. But it was almost a year ago, and... I should probably just let it go. Anyway, Zhao takes a picture of Bond and- No, you know what? I'm not gonna let it go! Sony Pictures and all the movie theater chains that pulled the interview should still be shamed for what they did. It was stupid, it was cowardly, and it was complete horseshit. When Die Another Day came out in 2002, the North Korean government wasn't happy about it, though let's face it, they rarely have much reason to be happy nowadays, but no one was worried about any violent retaliation, and two years later, when Team America World Police hit theaters with its very silly portrayal of Kim Jong-il, was there widespread panic and calls to ban the film? Was anyone worried about North Korean assassins trying to take out Trey Parker and Matt Stone? Hell no! Because that would be stupid! And in 2012, the Red Dawn remake portrayed the United States being invaded by North Korea. This was, of course, completely ridiculous, and it only happened because of a last-minute change. The invaders were originally going to be Chinese, but the studio ordered the change when they realized they could potentially lose a lot of money by alienating Chinese moviegoers. But again, no one was worried about any meaningful retaliation from North Korea. But some mysterious computer hackers get pissy about a couple of stoners making a stupid comedy about assassinating Kim Jong-un and suddenly everyone in Hollywood considers North Korea a credible threat? Now they're seriously worried about terrorist attacks on movie theaters by angry militants from Best Korea? Even when President Barack Obama himself told them they were overreacting. No way, I am not letting this go. No one should let this go. We should all remember just how stupid this was in order to ensure it does not happen again. Ever. I get the feeling I've gone off track here. Oh, right, right, die another day. <clears throat> so, Zhao takes a picture of Bond and sends it to their contact in the West, who identifies Bond and blows his cover. 
Colonel Moon responds by blowing some shit up and taking Bond captive. Why wouldn't he just kill him? Oh, right, it's a Bond movie. You British still believe you have the right to police the world. Are you sure you're not confusing Britain with America? They get word Colonel Moon's father, General Moon, is on his way, and since Daddy wouldn't approve of what his son has been doing in his spare time, he runs for the hills. In the midst of the chaos, Bond uses this opportunity to blow a C4 charge he hid amongst the diamonds. The explosion embeds several diamonds in Zhao's face, although that much C4 probably should have blown his face clean off, and Bond hijacks a hovercraft to go after Moon. Moon apparently uses these hovercraft to cross the demilitarized zone without tripping any of the landmines. I'm pretty sure avoiding landmines in real life is slightly more complicated than that, but shh, just pretend. What follows is a chase scene with damn near everything exploding. Even things that seemingly have no reason to explode. Did Michael Bay direct this? The chase ends when Bond finds his way onto Colonel Moon's hovercraft and runs it off a cliff, barely escaping with his own life. <sighs> Saved by the bell. But he's immediately captured by General Moon, which leads into our opening title sequence. As far as James Bond opening title sequences go, I suppose it's okay. It was a neat idea to have the title sequence actually depict part of the plot instead of just being its own separate thing. To date, it's the only time they've done this. Unfortunately, it's marred by what is hands down the worst Bond theme song ever, Madonna's Die Another Day. While I'm not a huge fan, I normally don't have a problem with Madonna's music, but this is just awful. The lyrics are complete nonsense, the production is headache-inducing, and there is way too much auto-tune. Why in God's name would you ever auto-tune Madonna? She can actually sing, you know. She's been doing it for many years, she's quite good at it. Bond spends 14 months in captivity, which is rather surprising considering how easily he has escaped his captors in the past, but whatever. I don't condone what they do here. But I allowed it to go on for the last 14 months because... Look, my troops were bored and they needed something to do. What do you want from me? After all this time, it appears the Koreans have become sick of Bond and are prepared to execute him. But Bond quickly discovers he is not about to be killed, but traded. For Zhao. And he still has the diamonds in his face? How hard can it really be to pluck those things out? Bond is taken onto a naval vessel and doctors analyze his health with some weird laser doohickey. Is this James Bond or Star Trek? M, played by Judi Dench, who deserves so much better, brings Bond up to speed. Someone has been leaking information to North Korea and they assumed it had to be Bond because... reasons. So they made a deal to get him back in exchange for Zhao. Bond, of course, proclaims his innocence and demands he be released so he can go after Zhao, but M isn't having it. So Bond has to plan his own escape by... stopping his own heart? What? The doctors resuscitate him and Bond immediately zaps them with the defibrillator. Of course, defibrillators don't actually work that way, but again, shh, just pretend. Bond then escapes from the ship a little too easily. He couldn't escape a primitive North Korean dungeon after 14 months, but he can escape MI6 custody in just a few minutes? Bullshit. And speaking of bullshit, what the hell am I looking at? I played video games with more convincing backgrounds. This movie had a budget of $142 million, and I'm having trouble figuring out where that money went. I'm sure they spent at least $20 million on Brosnan's hair gel, but still. Bond saunters into the Hong Kong Yacht Club as is, which is hilarious, but it looks like he has friends in high places as the hotel manager recognizes him immediately and gives him the presidential suite and a fresh change of clothes. And since the manager also happens to be with Chinese intelligence, he arranges for Bond to fly to Cuba where Zhao was last spotted. Well, this is just a little too convenient, isn't it? The man was just blacklisted by MI6. Now, I can believe a man like James Bond could find a way around that, wouldn't be the first time, but it should still require some goddamn effort. Bond heads to Havana, where he makes contact with another man designed to make his job far too easy, and he finds out Zhao has traveled to a medical clinic on the fictional Isla de los Organos. A medical clinic on the Isle of Organs. Subtle. But before he can head to the island, he naturally has to make contact with this movie's Bond girl, Jinx, played by Halle Berry. 
As you can see, Miss Berry is enjoying the Caribbean and a lovely Honey Rider reference. And there's a reason for this. Die Another Day was intended to be a celebration of Bond's history as it was the 20th official Bond film, and it contained several references to previous movies. Unfortunately, not only does this violate the rule of not referring to a better movie, or several better movies during your own, but it seems they put more focus on callbacks and not enough on making the current film good. Case in point, the absolutely horrendous dialogue when Bond first meets Jinx. Oh, I'm just here for the birds. Ornithologist. Wow. Now there's a mouthful. Get it? It's funny because she said there's a mouthful while looking at his penis. Ha! And then we get to the pointless sex scene, which is far more graphic than you'd expect it to be. Of course, sex has always been part of the Bond films, but it's usually implied rather than shown. It is pretty tame by today's standards, especially for, say, the average Game of Thrones viewer, but for a Bond movie, it just feels... out of place. The next day, Bond heads to the clinic, and sure enough, Zhao is there undergoing DNA replacement therapy, a procedure that is apparently slowly turning him from an Asian man into a white dude. And if you think that sounds ridiculous... You're right, it is, but it gets worse. Do you know how this extremely delicate and complicated medical procedure that replaces a person's entire DNA makeup is done? Bone marrow transplant. I'm not kidding, that's actually how they explain it. They kill off the existing bone marrow, swap in some fresh DNA, and presto, you've changed your race. And to think, all this time Rachel Dolezal has been doing it the hard way. This is so stupid, I hardly know where to begin. If you kill off a person's bone marrow, one of two things will happen. A, that person will die, or B, that person will fucking die. And simply replacing bone marrow isn't nearly enough to change a person's DNA. DNA exists in every part of your body, not just the bone marrow. For the love of God, Moonraker was more scientifically sound than Die Another Day. And that is saying something. Oh, and the cherry on top of this Sunday of ridiculousness? Zhao still has the diamonds in his face. Why? If he's trying to change his identity, shouldn't removing the diamonds be step one? There aren't exactly a lot of people just walking around with face diamonds. Even if they somehow turn him into a white guy, they're still gonna be able to pick him out of a crowd. Zhao manages to get away from Bond, but what's this? Jinx is also on the island looking for Zhao. Unbeknownst to Bond, she's with the NSA. Unfortunately, she also fails to kill Zhao and she's cornered by the guards. But she escapes by... diving off the wall? And a boat is just waiting for her down below? Okay, one, that was a terrible special effect. Two, at that height, even if she hits the water, the impact is still probably going to kill her. At the very least, she's not going to be able to just swim away like nothing happened. And three, the boat was there waiting for her? So this was her escape plan all along? Hang on to your hats, folks. We have just hit DerpCon 3. Bond manages to snag a trinket off of Zhao before he escapes, and inside he finds diamonds. With the help of his Cuban contact, he learns they belong to a man named Gustav Graves, played by Toby Stevens. But apart from his laser signature, the diamonds are identical to African conflict diamonds. What an amazing coincidence. Since Graves is scheduled to be knighted, because reasons, Bond takes a flight on product placement airlines back to the UK. Despite being on an MI6 watch list, it is apparently just that easy for him to return to his home country. I'm starting to think Bond's status as a super spy is less because of his own skills and abilities and more because everyone around him is incompetent. Bond witnesses Graves arriving at Buckingham Palace by skydiving in, with a not at all subtle reference to the spy who loved me, and it seems a bit unlikely that the Queen would allow him to do such a thing, knighthood or not. Hell, the filmmakers had to move heaven and earth just to film this scene. 
The official story on Mr. Graves is he was an orphan working in an Argentinian diamond mine, and at some point within the last year, he discovered diamonds in Iceland. He then immigrated to the UK and already speaks with a perfect English accent. Sounds legit. As we discover later in the film, and as you may have already guessed, Gustav Graves is not what he seems. He is, in fact, Colonel Moon, who has gone through the same DNA replacement therapy that Zhao was in the middle of before he was rudely interrupted by Bond. This blows my mind on so many levels. Even if we accept that Moon somehow survived his fall at the beginning of the film, how did he go through the DNA replacement process, change his legal identity, set up a fake diamond mine in Iceland, become a British citizen, and earn a knighthood all in the span of 14 months? One would think the Crown would do some research on the man they plan to knight and would raise a few eyebrows when they discover he didn't exist until about a year ago. I could understand if Graves was actually a real person and Moon assumed his identity and killed or otherwise eliminated the real Graves, similar to what Blofeld did in Diamonds Are Forever, but that's not what they did here. And given this movie's penchant for referencing older Bond films, I'm kinda surprised they didn't go in that direction. And why did Moon go through the trouble of DNA replacement therapy when plastic surgery would have been much simpler and accomplished the same thing? Again, it worked for Blofeld. Twice, in fact. Methinks the filmmakers would have been better off by remembering the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. Bond eventually meets up with Graves at a fencing club, along with his assistant, Miranda Frost, played by future Oscar nominee, Rosamund Pike. This was her film debut, by the way. It's a miracle her career lasted long enough to get to Gone Girl. Bond challenges Graves to a friendly wager using one of the diamonds he took from Zhao. Then diamonds are for everyone. Oh, shut up. And while it starts off as a regular fencing match, it quickly escalates to first blood from the torso. Well, that's what they say it is, but they're clearly well beyond that. They're trying to murder each other. And everyone else just stands by and watches in horror as they destroy the club and recklessly endanger several innocent bystanders. And of course, no one thinks to call the police because, well, that would just be silly. I will give Brosnan and Stevens credit for doing most of the stunt work in this scene, but even their best efforts can't prevent it from looking completely ridiculous. After nearly killing each other, Bond and Graves are suddenly best friends, because why not, and Graves invites Bond to the unveiling of his latest invention in Iceland. I expect the pleasure of you in Iceland. I'm afraid you'll never have that pleasure, Mr. Bond. Ooh, how cold. And her name is Frost, I get it. Bond then gets a message from M directing him to an abandoned subway station where she immediately has him locked up for disobeying orders, property damage, reckless endangerment of civilians, and all-around stupidity. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say that's what she should have done. What she actually does is put Bond back on active duty so he can go to Iceland and further look into Gustav Graves. Apparently the M stands for moron. And Bond isn't the only one looking into Graves. It turns out Miss Frost is with MI6 as well, and her job as Graves' assistant is just a cover. You volunteered for this operation, but in three months you've turned up next to nothing. Gee, why do you suppose that is? Before Bond can officially begin his mission, he of course has to get his standard assortment of gadgets from Q, played for the first time by John Cleese after being named the successor to the original Q, Desmond Llewellyn, in the previous film, The World Is Not Enough. It would also be the last time Cleese would play the character as the producers hit the reset button in 2006 with Casino Royale, and when they eventually reintroduced the character in Skyfall, they cast Ben Wishaw in the role. It's too bad Cleese had such a short time as Q. I, for one, thought he played the part quite well. He's certainly one of the better parts of Die Another Day. You know, you're cleverer than you look. Hmm, still better than looking cleverer than you are. In addition to showing off some gadgets from previous Bond movies, because did we mention this is the 20th Bond film? Did we? Because it totally is. Q gives Bond his equipment for his current adventure a ring that shatters glass, make sure you turn that off before you grab a drink at the bar, and perhaps the most ridiculous gadget in the history of the franchise, a car that turns invisible. The car has a friggin' cloaking device? Again, is this James Bond or Star Trek? As we move ahead to Iceland, and even the movie seems to be in a hurry, unless I accidentally stepped on the remote and hit the fast forward button, 
Bond arrives to discover Graves has built himself an ice palace. Because when you have as much money as he does, who's gonna tell you no? I'm Mr. Kill. Come again? I'm Mr. Kill. Mr. Kill. His name is Mr. Kill. That's just dumb. I can't even think of a joke for that. It's just dumb. Well, there's a name to die for. Shut up, Bond. You're not helping. Oh, and Jinx is there too, posing as a rep for a science magazine. I do hope that means we get more god-awful dialogue. I take it Mr. Bond's been explaining his Big Bang Theory. Oh, yeah, I think I got the thrust of it. I'd like to thrust you into a wood chipper. Graves has invited many people to Iceland to demonstrate his latest invention. Icarus, a satellite that can reflect sunlight anywhere in the world, allowing for the presence of daylight 24-7. And it looks like they achieved this effect in the movie by simply cranking the brightness way too high. I can do the same thing, and my video didn't cost $142 million. Though I wonder if I could find a way to claim it did. It'd be a hell of a tax write-off. Bond does some snooping around, but gets discovered by one of the guards, and they quickly sound the alarm. Fortunately, Miss Frost bails him out by pretending to be his lover. And I guess she figured, hey, as long as we're pretending, might as well go all the way. Man, she went from fuck you, James, to fuck me, James, in about 60 seconds. Although, to be fair, it's not the first time that's happened, so... Whatever, we'll go with it. While they're having their sexy time, Jinx decides to do some snooping of her own. Thanks to Bond, an alarm has recently gone off and security is on high alert, so I don't see any way this could possibly end badly. Well, what do you know? It ended badly. And he still has the... So Jinx has been captured and... Okay, what is up with the editing in this movie? There's nothing wrong with using fast and slow motion shots in your movie, as long as they serve a purpose, but in Die Another Day, they seem to happen completely at random. I'm starting to wonder if the director was entirely sober when he made this movie. Who sent you? Your mama. And the same goes for the writers. The screenplay was written by Neil Purvis and Robert Wade, who are no strangers to the franchise as they've worked on every film in the series since The World Is Not Enough. I was surprised to learn this since half of the Bond movies they've worked on have been quite good, and even the lesser ones weren't anywhere near as bad as Die Another Day. However, on all of the Bond movies they've worked on, one or two more writers were brought in to polish their scripts before filming began. All except for one. What an amazing coincidence. Mr. Kill proceeds to slowly kill off Jinx with a laser in an obvious nod to Goldfinger, but Bond, reinvigorated after a good shag, just happens to show up to save the day. And with all these freaking laser beams, could this fight look any more ridiculous? The answer is... yes. <laughs> with Mr. Kill uh, killed, Jinx heads back to the Ice Palace to warn Frost to get out while Bond goes after Graves. But it turns out Frost is already in Graves' office. Unfortunately for Bond. It's a trap! Yep, Frost is North Korea's MI6 mole. Surprise, surprise. I'd explain why she's the mole, but the explanation is stupid and you don't care anyway, so let's move on. While Jinx is trapped in the Ice Palace, Graves goes through the traditional explain my master plan just before I kill you, Mr. Bond speech, and since they're conveniently standing on a glass floor, Bond uses his sonic ring to escape. <laughs> they then proceed to shoot their rather noisy machine guns at Bond, and when he hijacks Graves' ice dragster, Graves reveals the true purpose of Icarus, using the power of the sun as a weapon. This is your idea of killing him quietly? I think they can hear you in Australia! Bond dangles over the edge of a cliff in an incredibly cheap-looking special effect, and then surfs his way to freedom in an absolutely dreadful CGI sequence. This movie came out the same year as The Two Towers! How are the effects this bad?! To cut a long car chase short, Graves attempts to kill Jinx by melting the ice palace and drowning her, because shooting her is out of the question for some reason, but Bond rescues her and kills Zhao by dropping a chandelier on him. 
or in front of him. Graves escapes to, um, Pyongyang. Even on the Blu-ray, they still haven't fixed that mistake. So Bond and Jinx are sent after him by M and Jinx's NSA boss, played by Michael Madsen, who's clearly just here for the paycheck as he's not even trying to show an ounce of emotion. Just in case you thought his performance in Uwe Ball's Blood Rain was a fluke. After parachuting into North Korea, what, did they run out of surfboards? They stow away on Graves' plane, and Jinx sneaks into the cockpit while the pilot goes off to the lavatory. We never see that pilot again, by the way. I guess he really had to go. While Jinx takes control of the plane, Bond goes after Graves, who, by the power of Connery's toupee, what is he wearing? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you... Robodork. Someone was paid to design that costume. Graves is showing his father how Icarus can easily clear the minefield in the DMZ to clear a path for an invasion of South Korea. The general, however, is not at all pleased with his son's actions, prompting Graves to kill him with a terrible slow motion effect. Bond tries to take out Graves but accidentally shoots the window in another tribute to Goldfinger, which leads to everyone but Graves and Bond getting sucked out of the plane. Jinx manages to stabilize the plane, but she's caught by- Okay, now what the fuck is she wearing? Somehow, I don't think that's appropriate fencing gear. Jinx puts the plane on autopilot and flies it right through the Icarus beam, which somehow doesn't completely destroy the plane, but it's definitely not going to stay in the air much longer. She takes out Frost without too much trouble, but Bond seems to be having worse luck with Graves. Oh look! Parachutes for the both of us! Whoops! Did you seriously only stock two parachutes on the entire plane? Come on, Graves! Even if you're a megalomaniac bent on world domination, safety should always be priority number one. But the parachute proves to be his own undoing, and as Graves goes through the engine, Icarus is deactivated and the world is saved. Well, we just came inches away from annihilation. I see no reason to have a reaction. And Bond and Jinx escape in a helicopter and celebrate their victory by banging on a pile of diamonds. Which sounds terribly uncomfortable. So that's Die Another Day. It kind of sucks. The story is stupid, the villains are silly, the dialogue is ugh. The random fast and slow motion is annoying, the references to older Bond films aren't nearly as clever as the filmmakers seem to think they are, and the special effects are just wretched. Now I don't expect every Bond movie to be a masterpiece, when you make 20 films they can't all be winners, but usually even when a Bond movie is bad, it's still enjoyable. Moonraker is a good example of this. Die Another Day is not. It's just plain terrible. I know many people will disagree with me on this one. The film did get several positive reviews upon release, and it was the highest grossing Bond film at the time. But it has received its fair share of criticism as well, so I'm not alone. Among the film's critics was former James Bond actor Roger Moore, who blasted the terrible CGI and the invisible car in particular. I thought it just went too far. And that's from me, the first Bond in space. He's right. Do you know that? In any case, the movie's reception apparently wasn't as good as the producers were hoping for since they rebooted the series with Daniel Craig for the next movie. The studio also dropped plans for a spin-off movie based on Halle Berry's Jinx character, presumably once the cocaine wore off and they asked themselves, wait, why are we making a Jinx movie? Was anyone asking for this? If you're a fan of this movie, fine. You're certainly not alone. But in this reviewer's not-so-humble opinion, Die Another Day represents the worst of the Bond series and is best left forgotten. It's a shame this was Pierce Brosnan's exit from the franchise. He deserved better. That's all for today. And with the holidays coming up, I think I'm about due for a vacation. To someplace far, far away. Until next time, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. So you live to die another day. Hey, that's the name of the movie!